If you've been researching Home Assistant, you may be aware that there are two main ways to install it. The first way is by using the Home Assistant operating system, and the second is the Home Assistant container running on Docker. One of the main differences between these two installation methods is that the Home Assistant operating system comes with the ability to install add-ons, whereas the Home Assistant container version doesn't. A lot of people are put off by the Home Assistant container version because they're worried they won't be able to live without these add-ons. But I'm here to tell you that it's not as scary as you think. In fact, relying solely on the services that are available through add-ons limits what you can do in your smart home or on your home network. There are thousands of applications out there that run on Docker that do all sorts of cool things, many more than there are Home Assistant add-ons. I have personally been running Home Assistant on Docker for over a year now, and in this video I'm going to show you how I run different smart home services on Docker and why I don't need add-ons. I'm going to show you three things that will help you live without add-ons when using Home Assistant Container. Firstly, I'll show you how you can edit your Home Assistant configuration.yaml file without the file editor or Visual Studio Code add-on. Secondly, I'll show you how you can map a Zigbee or Z-Wave USB stick from your host operating system to your Docker containers so that you can pair those devices. And finally, I'll show you how you can use a Docker container to replicate the functionality of almost any third-party add-on like Z-Wave.js, Node-RED, or Plex Media Server. Let's take a look. Hey Home Automation Guy, start the show. If you're not sure if Home Assistant Container is the right installation method for you, or you're not really sure what add-ons are, then I urge you to check out a previous video I did which explains both the pros and cons of the Home Assistant OS and the Home Assistant Container versions. I've also made a video which shows you how to install Docker, Docker Compose, and Home Assistant Container onto a Linux computer, which is kind of the prequel to this video. I've linked both of these videos in the description below. This video is meant to be a high-level overview that shows you how all of this works in principle. Some of the steps I'm going to show you are quite technical, so I've written a blog post that explains all of this in more detail, which I've also linked in the description below. If you want to recreate this in your own smart home, then I suggest you check that post out so you can go through the steps at your own pace. Even though the Home Assistant developers are working hard to make everything configurable via the user interface, there are still some things in Home Assistant that can only be done by editing the configuration.yaml file. People running the Home Assistant operating system often install the popular file editor or Visual Studio Code server add-ons so they can edit these files directly from within the user interface. Unfortunately, that's just not possible when you're using the Home Assistant container version, so you'll need to find another way to edit these files. Of course, you can always SSH into your Ubuntu or other Linux operating system and use a text editor like Nano to edit these files. But I find that really cumbersome, and I would much rather prefer to use a nice file editor like the free Visual Studio Code Editor from Microsoft. VS Code runs on Windows and Mac, and can actually be configured to open up and edit files on remote Linux computers and servers via SSH. That means that you can open up VS Code on your computer, and directly edit the configuration.yaml files or your Docker Compose files living on your Ubuntu Linux computer. It takes a little bit to configure, but once it's set up, it just works. Firstly, if you haven't already got Visual Studio installed, then you should just go to the Microsoft website, download, and install it. I've linked to the right place in the blog post I mentioned earlier. Follow the bouncing ball through the installation and setup wizard. I normally accept all the defaults, but I find it useful to add the Open with Code options to the right-click menus, as it makes things easier for me in the long run. VS Code is a very powerful but easy-to-use text editor. It's like Notepad, but way more useful and a valuable tool to have in your toolkit. It isn't very overwhelming, so you should be able to navigate yourself around it very easily. It's very similar to the File Editor add-on, and it's almost exactly the same as the Visual Studio Code Server add-on. I'll be using VS Code a lot during this video, so you'll soon see how easy and useful it is. Once the installation is complete, open up VS Code, and it should look something like this. One of the most powerful parts of VS Code is the fact that you can install extensions, which provide extra bits of functionality, and we're going to start by adding the remote SSH extension. You do that by clicking on the extensions icon in the left-hand menu, and then start typing remote in the search box until you see the extension we're looking for. Click the install button to add it to your editor. As we're going to be working mostly with YAML files, I also find it a good idea to add the YAML extension. This will help you correctly format your YAML files, and will color code them so they're easier to read. Now we'll be using this remote extension to remotely connect our Linux server via SSH and directly access the Home Assistant configuration or other YAML files. You can do this by clicking on the Remote Explorer icon in the left menu. 
Here we click the plus button at the top to add a new SSH target and enter the right details. These are the words SSH, then the username that we use to log in, followed by the at symbol and the IP address of our Linux server, just like I'm doing on the screen now, and then press enter to confirm. Next we want to accept the default place to store these details by pressing enter so that we don't need to type them in each time, and you'll see the remote host added to the list. We can now right click on that and select connect to host in current window, which will remotely connect us to that IP address via SSH. We confirm that we want to connect and accept the key, and then we type in the password that we normally use to connect over SSH. Once we're connected, we want to open the folder that contains all of our container files. I always store my files under the slash opt directory, so that is the one I'm going to open by typing slash opt into the box and pressing enter. You should now see a list of all the files and the directory structure that you have on your Linux server. You can see here that I have my Docker Compose YAML files and my Home Assistant configuration directory with all of its own YAML files. I can edit these files from this text editor right now, and if I press save, it will update that file instantly on the Linux server. If you've seen my how to install Docker and Home Assistant video, you'll know that I store all my Docker configuration files in the slash opt directory of my host Ubuntu operating system. Because I've connected my Visual Studio to this slash opt directory, I can edit any of the configuration files of any of my Docker containers from this one single text editor. It makes working with multiple containers super easy. The second thing that people running Home Assistant in Docker often find difficult is accessing USB sticks that are plugged into the host directly and using them in their containers. A common example is someone who plugs a Zigbee USB coordinator into their host machine, tries to configure the ZHA integration only to find that their USB stick is not in the list and they can't go forward. The same thing happens with Z-Wave sticks or Google Coral TPUs. To make a USB device accessible to an application running in a container, you need to map the USB serial port through to the Docker container itself. It's pretty easy to do this via your Docker Compose file, and I'll show you how to do that now. The first thing we need to do is SSH into our Linux computer and run a special command that lists all of the serial devices that are plugged in. Don't worry, this command is detailed in the companion blog post, which I've linked in the description below. This command lists all of the serial devices connected to your host, and you can see that I've only got one connected, which is my USB Zigbee dongle. The bit that we're interested in is the yellow bit at the end, the slash TTY USB zero part. Copy this or make note of it, and then switch back to your VS Code editor and the Docker Compose YAML file. In the Home Assistant section of your Docker Compose file, we'll now add a new devices key and map that TTY USB zero port from our host to our Docker container. This works very similarly to how you map files and folders from your host to your containers. We're mapping the slash dev slash TTY USB zero from your host to the same place in the container. We now save this file, and because we've modified the docker compose YAML file, we need to rerun the docker compose up hyphen D command from the slash op directory in an SSH session on our Linux computer. This will recreate the container with the serial port mapped correctly. We can now switch back to Home Assistant and add the Zigbee Home Assistant integration again, and you should see the USB stick in the list. Using this method, you can map a USB device to any container. I personally use it to map my Zigbee USB stick to my Zigbee to MQTT container, and to map my Google Coral TPU to my Frigate video recorder container to help with object detection. And finally, many people use add-ons to run non-Home Assistant services like Mosquito, Zigbee to MQTT, ZWave.js, Node-RED, Plex Media Server, or WireGuard VPN. Whilst it's really easy to add these to your Home Assistant using an add-on, it's not that much harder to do the same thing via Docker containers. Most of these services have instructions online for how you can add them via Docker Compose that you can really easily Google. I'm gonna show you an example of how easy it is to add a container that runs a third-party application, in this case, Plex Media Server. Like I said, you can literally use your favorite search engine to find a sample Docker Compose file and set up instructions for any application you're looking for. I'd wager that almost every Home Assistant application add-on out there can be installed in this way. Many applications have example Docker Compose files available, but once you've set up a couple of these containers using templates, you'll probably figure out how to construct these yourself and get exactly what you want. Copy the template and switch back to your Visual Studio editor and paste this into the bottom of your Docker Compose file. 
Make sure that you have the indenting correct, but the Visual Studio YAML extension should help you see if you've messed it up. Now you can make any customizations or changes to the container configuration. In my case, I changed the data volumes that are mounted into the container to make sure they're located in my slash op directory, but you should change these to be wherever you keep your media. Once you've got the file how you want it, you can save it. As we've made changes to the docker compose file, we now need to go back to the SSH session on our Linux server, navigate back to the directory that the file is stored in, and run the docker compose up hyphen d command to create the Plex server container. You can see it pulling down the required images and setting that container up. Once it's done, we can go back to our Home Assistant UI, open up the Portainer application that we installed in the Home Assistant and Docker video, and we'll now see the new Plex container added here. I really like using these iframe panels to access the web interfaces of my applications running in my Docker containers from directly within the Home Assistant UI. Let's add the Plex Media Server UI as another panel. To do this, I switch back to the Visual Studio Code Editor, and you can immediately see that there is a new directory listed here, which was created when we fired up the Plex container. If there are any configuration files for this container, they could be immediately edited from here. But to add the iframe panel to Home Assistant, we need to go to our Home Assistant config directory and open up the configuration.yaml file. We now add a new key to the panel iframe area with the web interface URL. I'm also going to add the Plex icon. We then save the file, and because we've updated the configuration file, we need to restart Home Assistant for the changes to take effect. After the restart, you can see that the Plex item is now listed in the navigation menu, and when you click on it, you can see the Plex user interface loaded up directly inside Home Assistant. The process for installing any other third-party service like Zigbee to MQTT, Node-RED, or WireGuard VPN as a container is almost exactly the same. Just find the Docker Compose entry you need for that service, copy it into the Docker Compose YAML file, and make any modifications that you need for your environment. These are usually things like updating any IP addresses or directory mappings. You then need to run docker compose up hyphen D to pull the images and run that container. If you have a favorite Home Assistant add-on that you don't think you can live without, and you're worried about how you'd run it as a docker container, then please let me know in the comments below and I may make a video about it. The main advantage of using docker and the Home Assistant container version is that you're not only limited to what's available in the Home Assistant add-on store. There are many, many more docker containers available than there are add-ons. For example, the Pi-hole DNS service that I use to block ads and tracking cookies on my home network is available as a Docker container, but not as a Home Assistant add-on. The same goes for DeepStack AI, which is an AI face recognition system that can be used to tell you whether the person detected on your security camera is a member of your family or a complete stranger. You may be able to find add-ons that are similar or workarounds, but you don't get the freedom and choice that you can with applications running on Docker. You should hopefully see by now that using Docker like this opens up a whole world of possibilities for your smart home that weren't previously available via the Home Assistant operating system. That said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the Home Assistant OS, and if you're using it in your home and it's working for you, then I see no reason why you need to change it. If you're running it on a Raspberry Pi and you're starting to find it's a bit sluggish, you can always install Home Assistant OS directly onto an Intel NUC PC or similar and get all of the advantages of add-ons in the supervisor without all the faff of managing Docker yourself. Or you could run a hypervisor and virtual machines, installing Home Assistant OS in one VM and an Ubuntu Linux server running Docker into another VM. That way you get the best of both worlds. There are a lot of options and you need to find the one that works best for your smart home, the equipment that you have access to, and your skill level. Just because I found that Docker works the best for me, doesn't mean it's the best solution for you. But if you're running Home Assistant on Docker, then stick around, because in the next video we'll be taking a look at how we can recreate the final pieces of work that the supervisor handles, which is keeping your Linux operating system, Home Assistant, and other containers up to date. We'll also be taking a look at how you can back up your entire Docker home automation platform to somewhere safe, like Google Drive or similar. So make sure that you're subscribed so that together we can make your home smarter.